So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, seminar. Um, and it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, uh, for me to, to introduce uh, Professor Jan Bruckner from the uh, Department of Economics from the University of California uh, uh, at Irvine, where he is a distinguished professor. And uh, he has a lot, so many contributions in the area of uh, air transport, air transport economics that have been very influential that people like me um, may tend to forget that it's actually not really his main area of research. The main area is urban economics and he has been the editor of the Journal of Urban Economics for 16 years, for instance. So uh, yeah, but today uh, is the to his topic is on air transport economics uh, and uh, we have a great audience here today from all over the world, from Brazil, Japan, US, and uh, you know all all you know, participants from all over the um, all over the globe. So this is uh, really great. And uh, um, then, uh, I, I will give the floor to you right away because you mentioned that uh, you know there have a, quite a few slides, a lot to say. So I will stop here and hope, hand over to you right away. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you, Akim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, hello to all my friends out there who are in the audience. So um, this is a talk about schedule buffers. And the paper was co-authored with Akim and also with Alberto Gaggero, who, is, who was in Italy where it's the middle of the night. So he's not in attendance. Um, but anyway, so uh, if I could get the slides, I, we can get started. Let me say to everyone that I prefer if we keep um, questions during the talk to just clarifying questions, because I'm not entirely sure uh, how long this will take, and I don't want to go over a lot. So clarifying questions during the talk and substantive questions, debates or whatever at the end, okay? All right, so there is the, t there is the title page of the paper. Um, the focus is on propagated delays, and you'll hear about what those are shortly. So flight delays are, are a worldwide problem. We, we all know that, and they cost many, many billions of dollars um, around the world, over 30 billion in the U.S. in a recent year. Um, growing congestion is a, is a source of, um, of these delays, but even though now it takes longer for flights to operate because endpoints are frequently congested, all the airlines have to do is add some time to their scheduled uh, direct flight durations. And that's happened over the years and it's known as schedule padding. But schedule padding can't solve another problem, which is sort of random durations in, in flight times due to idiosyncratic events like weather, mechanical issues, unanticipated congestion. And so the airlines need to near, need to craft their schedules knowing that um, these idiosyncratic events are going to occur and they may affect, affect earliness or lateness of flights. Now, when flights are late, uh, not, not only does it inconvenience the people on board, but it can also cause delay propagation where the late arrival of the inbound aircraft causes the next flight to depart and arrive late. And in fact, here's a graph that shows that the different uh, contributors to, um, to late departures. And the main one is the incoming aircraft arriving late. That's the red um, line at the top of the graph. So um, you can see that this uh, late arrivals of incoming aircraft are a major issue. So, <sighs> Schedule buffers are the way that airlines deal with this problem, this randomness problem in, in flight duration. So there are two types of buffers. One is a flight buffer, and that's the extra scheduled time beyond the expected flight time. So there may be some average flight time. And the airline doesn't set the flight duration equal to the average time. They are likely to set it to be greater than the average time in order to provide a cushion. So having a flight buffer reduces the chance of delay, but it may make flights arrive early. 
and we've all been on flights that arrive early, it happens occasionally. And so the flight buffer increases the chance of early arrival while helping the lateness problem. So a ground buffer is, is the other type of buffer that, that we talk about and is used in the industry. And that's the extra ground time added beyond the minimum uh, turnaround time for a flight. So if it, takes, if it takes 30 minutes to turn around the plane and, there, and the, the schedule turnaround is 45, that, that implies that there's a 15 minute ground buffer that's been added. And so what the paper does is it, um, it provides a theoretical analysis of the airline's buffer choices in a model with only two flights. So there's one flight and then another flight, and the second flight can be subject to lay propagation, as we'll see. The paper is, has a, a lot of, of a theoretical component, but it also has uh, a big empirical section too, sorry a big empirical section um, that was mainly the, the, the work of Alberto, our, our, our co-author. And so th this empirical work uses data that many people now use, which is the uh, detailed US data on flight operations that focuses on individual aircraft operations over the day. So we use this data to, to test a number of hypotheses that, that come out of the model. So the previous literature on this issue of flight delays and delay propagation, the previous analytical literature is mostly in operations research and transport engineering. Um, so the, the, the papers listed there are an example of, of some of the, some of the uh, research that's been done on this question. And there are many, many more papers uh, cited in the, um, in the paper itself. So, these guys being engineers and operations, operations research people, they like simulation. They like complexity and simulation. We, being economists, we like simplicity and, and theorems. Um, and what we do in this paper, we construct a simple model that allows us to generate some transparent analytical uh, results. Now, I don't mean to say that the operations research approach is inferior. It's not. It serves a different purpose. It's more grounded in the real world than what we economists do. But our hope as economists is to um, generate some insights that might be obscured in a complicated, uh, uh, realistic model. All right, so let me go through the theory here. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about, to get oriented, we're going to talk about uh, a situation where we just have one flight. There's a single flight operating, and so there's no issue of delay propagation. There's no second flight. Okay, but we can see some of the principles of, of buffers in this um, in the single flight model, and we use it as a benchmark for comparing the two flight model later on. So let's consider this single flight. It departs at um, at time zero, and it arrives at time. Uh, T hat A1. And so what's T hat A1? Well, it's it's composed of, here, let me get this thing going here. It's composed, of the, the, the actual arrival time is composed of the, the expected flight time M1 plus an error term epsilon one, okay? And epsilon one is mean zero with a density F1, okay? So the airline sets the scheduled arrival time, uh, TA1. This is without the hat. So the hat denotes actual. When there's no hat, there's, um, there is, um, uh, that's the actual, uh, that's the scheduled time. And so it sets this, uh, this arrival time knowing that uh, passengers don't want to be late or early. The cost per minute of late time for a passenger is X. And the cost of early time is y per minute. Now, early is much better than being late, so <clears throat> y is less than x. So the scheduled arrival time is given by what? Well, it looks kind of like the actual arrival time, but slightly different. So the scheduled arrival time, ta1, is equal to the expected time plus the flight buffer, b1. So b1 is the flight buffer. Um, Looks like my hats are off here. I don't know why that is. Um, 
So the flight is late, where, where TA1 hat is bigger than the schedule time TA1, when the random term epsilon1 is bigger than the buffer. And the flight's early when the random term is less than the buffer. So that all makes sense, right? So in analyzing the single flight model, we're going to make an assumption here, which we call excess capacity. The excess capacity assumption is that it means that the plane is available for more hours than the flight is going to take. So the plane is leased for T hours uh, of time, which is greater than the flight duration. Okay, and you'll see how that what that means in a second. And then the, we have flight and ground time costs, which are CF and CG. So an hour of flight time costs CF, an hour of ground time costs CG. So the components of these costs are clear. I mean, C, CF is the usual cost of operating plane. Ground time is expensive because <clears throat> gate rental Gate rentals are expensive. You have to pay the airport to keep your plane on the ground. And, you know, there are other elements of ground cost, too. And so the objective function in this single flight model is the passenger expected cost from lightness or earliness, which we'll see in a minute, plus the buffer cost. The buffer cost is this. It's the flight time, flight cost, CF, times the scheduled flight time, minus the ground time times the total time for which the airplane is leased is available minus the scheduled flight time. So the plane's going to be sitting on the ground after the flight and that's going to cost something. Now the expected um, <clears throat> cost from lateness or earliness is this. So here's, here is um, the X, the lateness cost times the expected value of lateness cost. And what is that? It's the, it's over the range of, of epsilon where epsilon is bigger than B1. That means the flight is late when epsilon is bigger than the buffer. So we're integrating over that range. And then we're subtracting the buffer from the, um, from the epsilon. This is the late time. So this, is, this integral is the expected of late time. And then over here, we have the expected early time, <clears throat> which is just the same, except now um, the range of epsilon is going to be different. It's going to be small epsilons, not big ones. And then the early time is going to be the difference between the buffer and the epsilon. So that sort of makes sense, right? And then we subtract off the, 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 the buffer, uh, the flight time and ground time costs. We drop, there's a constant term up here that gets dropped. So we just have this. Make sense? Um, so let's let f big F denote the cumulative distribution function of little f, which is, this is the density of f up here again. Then the first order condition for the uh, flight buffer is, is this condition here. It says, evaluate the CDF at B1, and that should be equal to this ratio here. Okay, so, um, so the ratio is, uh, what is that? Well, it's the, it's the lateness cost divided by the sum of the two costs plus the difference between the ground and the flight buffers, okay? <clears throat> now you can see that if, if CG close to CF, then this thing is gonna be bigger than a half. But if it's bigger than a half, that means that B1 star must be positive, given that <clears throat> with a symmetric distribution, the CDF is zero um, at, at zero. So we're gonna have a ground, we're gonna have a flight buffer that's positive, um, assuming that the ground time and the, the, uh, and the flight time are close in values. Any questions about that? Or is that clear? Okay. Uh, uh, Jan, uh, maybe there is this uh, chat box. So uh, um, someone, if they may have a question, they may be just having uh, the, using the chat box to ask. Uh, right. 
Okay, well, I don't, where's the chat box? Uh, so if you press the purple button, and then there is a little balloon uh, oh. sign, and there is a chat box. And when I, don't see, <clears throat> I don't see any questions. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't see any questions, so, so okay. far. Okay. Yeah. Right, so th that's the easy part. That's the, that's the single flight model. Now let's talk about the two flight model. So when the aircraft makes, remember what we're talking about is the same airplane. This airplane is gonna make the first flight and it's gonna make a second flight. We imagine that there are different people on the two flights. That doesn't, it doesn't change things if we have people who, who stay on the plane, but it's the easiest just to think that there's, there's separate people on the flights. So the point is that in a late arrival of flight one, may delay flight two's departure, possibly leading to its late arrival. So basically we want to quantify all that stuff here. Um, <clears throat> we want to quantify all that stuff. So let's figure this out. So flight two's scheduled departure time is equal to, this is TD2, it's equal to um, the scheduled arrival time of flight one, that's M1 plus B1, plus the scheduled ground time, TG, okay? And the ground buffer is the difference between the scheduled time and the minimum time, the minimum feasible turnaround time. So the ground buffer is BG, which equals TG minus TG bar, okay? And you can see that the ground buffer helps absorb the late arrival of flight one. Now, again, my hats are over to the left here. Let's let TD2 hat denote flight two's actual departure time. Okay, so the scheduled arrival time of flight two is given by TA2, and that's equal to the, the scheduled departure time plus the expected time in flight plus flight two's flight buffer, okay? Clear? So we're gonna just add, we're gonna take the scheduled uh, departure and then add on the stuff, the same stuff as before. Um, now flight two's actual arrival time is different from the scheduled arrival time for two reasons. It's different because the actual departure time might be, which is TD2 hat, might be different from the scheduled departure. That's one reason the two things could be different. And because the error term, epsilon two, experienced by flight two is gonna be different from B2, the, the buffer. Okay, so the scheduled and, and actual arrival times of flight two could be, could be different. Now, the next question is, what is the actual de departure time of flight two? What is it equal to? Well, it could be equal to the scheduled departure time, but maybe not. It's, it's not gonna be equal to, it's gonna be bigger than the scheduled departure time. It's gonna be later than the scheduled time if what happens? Well, the thing that's gonna happen is that the actual arrival time of flight one, which is M1 plus epsilon one, plus the minimum ground time has got to be bigger than the scheduled departure time. In other words, um, flight one is arriving. We need to turn that plane around, get it off again as flight two, but we only have TG bar minimum to do it. And if all of this stuff, this the sum of these three things is bigger than the um, than the scheduled departure time, then there's no way that flight um, that flight two can depart on time. And so the departure time is going to be this number, not this one. And so if we substitute in here for TD two, <clears throat> we have this um, this the max involves these two terms. Okay, and 
flight two departs on time then when um, this term is smaller than this term. In other words, when when we don't have uh, flight one isn't late enough to to cause us to break the the scheduled departure. Uh, uh, if we, uh, yeah, I think we can see the cursor right now. So if you want to show the cursor, then maybe you press the hand. Yeah. Was it was the cursor helpful or not, or was it a nuisance? Uh, I think it would would help. All right. Okay, so um, you have to do it for every slide again, I guess. Okay, yeah. All right, so um, all right, so so what we want to do now is we want to put in the um, so we want to retran we want to translate this thing into a statement about epsilon one, and so flight two flight two departs on time when epsilon one is less than this stuff, which we get by rearranging up here. It's less than that stuff, but just using the definition of the ground buffer, which is this difference here, it's just less than B1 plus BG. So flight two departs on time when epsilon one is less than B1, flight one's flight buffer plus the ground buffer. Now, if it departs on, if flight two departs on time, then it looks just like flight one from before in terms of what makes it late or early. What makes it late is if the epsilon two is bigger than B2. Okay. What makes it early is if epsilon two is less than B two. So when flight two departs on time, it looks just like flight one in terms of what makes it late. Okay. Now, when when so the question next question is what if fl flight two departs late? What are the circumstances make it arrive late or early? Um, so being late or early means that the actual departure time plus epsilon two is greater than less than um, TD2 plus B2. That comes from manipulating the inequalities on the previous page, previous slide. If we, if we rearrange all this stuff, um, flight two is late or early as when the following uh, inequalities hold. Flight two is late if epsilon two is bigger than the sum of all the buffers minus flight two's epsilon, flight one's epsilon, okay? So all the buffers together, along with flight one's random term, interact with epsilon two to determine whether the flight is late or early. So basically, big epsilon twos mean a, a late arrival, conditional on epsilon one. Small epsilon twos reverse the inequality here, and so they make uh, the flight early. All right. So now we have a complicated thing here, we, uh, or fairly complicated. We have four different cases. We have flight two departs late, and it either arrives late or early. In the previous slide, add flight two departs on time, and it either arrives late or early. So what we want to do is we want to compute the expected uh, cost of arriving late and the expected cost of arriving early. And um, this is the expected late cost. I won't go through it in detail, but the first part is a, is a situation where flight two departs on time. This bunch of integral, this double integral here corresponds to when flight two departs um, late. And you can see that this integral involves both epsilon one and epsilon two, as is clear from this situation up here. So we have this integral, which is the expected late cost. And then we can compute a similar integral for the expected early cost, okay? And then what we need to do is we need to add on the, the ex previous expression, expression for flight one, because flight one is in there too. The thing I've just been talking about was involved flight two. We have to consider flight one as well. So we have flight one's 
expected early late, er, uh, early late cost. Flight two is expected early late cost to summed up. And then we have to add the, uh, the, uh, the buffer costs. Now here, we are using a different um, excess capacity, a, a different assumption on excess capacity. This assumption and the, its status was the result of very heated debates between Occam and me. And uh, Occam won, but he, was, um, but he was right. But then we also, in the paper, we talk about what happens if a different assumption holds. Okay, so what's the assumption? The assumption of no excess capacity <clears throat> is that the, the, the plane is leased, is, is paid for, for the total scheduled usage of the plane. In other words, when the plane lands, that's it. There's, there's, it's, it doesn't sit around on the ground anymore at the end of the day. There's no ground cost. If you remember, there was a ground cost after flight one in the, flight, in the single flight model. Here, there's no uh, ground cost after the termination of flight two. And so when we, when we figure out what the buffer costs are and we throw out the constant terms that were in there before, now we get this kind of um, expression here where we have the CF times the sum of the flight buffers, CG times the ground buffer. So that looks reasonable, right? Okay, so um, we can also analyze the problem under two different excess capacity assumptions. And for a, a while, the paper was existed with a different excess capacity assumption or pairs of excess capacity assumptions. We could also assume that there's excessity in the two flight model, or we could eliminate excess capacity in the one flight model. The results are, are somewhat different and you can look at the paper to see, uh, see how the results change. Okay, so you know this looks like a sort of a nasty problem, right, with all those integrals and stuff. Um, turns out that we can simplify things a, a lot, and we can compute the first order conditions for the first. And uh, I want to show you what the first order conditions are, because the results are quite simple that we get. And um, and here's here's the first result. First result, for proposition one, is that flight one's buffer is set at the single flight value, the same as if it were operating by itself. And therefore, the flight one, because it takes the single flight value buffer does, that flight is not addressing delay propagation because it's as if the flight is operating all by itself. Delay propagation had placed no role in determining the, um, the, the size of the buffer for flight one. Now, what's the intuitive reason for that? Well, the reason is that the ground buffer is better than, the, than flight one's buffer as an instrument for addressing delay propagation. The reason is that it doesn't distort the late early trade-off for flight one. The ground buffer doesn't distort anything. We just add to the ground buffer, and that's better than adding to flight one's flight buffer. So we just leave flight one's buffer the way it, the way it was if that flight were operating all by itself. <clears throat> and so the work in, um, in addressing delay propagation is going to be done by the ground buffer and by flight two's buffer. And that this is proposition two. So the, uh, <clears throat> the ground buffer and, the, and flight two's buffer do the work and the apport of responsibility for the mitigation of delay propagation between these two buffers, <clears throat> it depends on the, the cost, the flight cost and the, um, and the ground time cost, depends on CF and CG. Now let's consider first the case where the, where the um, where ground time is costless. This is not reasonable assumption, but it's useful as a benchmark. So suppose ground time costs nothing. 
The best thing to do then is to have enough ground time, schedule enough ground time for the plane so that there's no possibility of delay propagation. Delay propagation is ruled out entirely. So when C is zero, the ground buffer does all the work addressing delay propagation, and in fact, it completely eliminates the chance of delay propagation. Now, you might notice that if, if this plane had uh, connecting passengers on it, that wouldn't be such a great idea, right? Because those guys would be waiting around for flight two, and that's, that's not good. Later in, in the paper, we talk about uh, connecting passengers, but they're not here now. So we just plane sit on the ground for as long as we want. Now, another situation is where, that, well, where the ground buffer does all the work. Um, is when CF is equal to CG, when the flight and the, uh, and the ground costs are, are equal. So now you want, you want the uh, ground buffer to do all the work in, in addressing delay propagation, but you're the plane's not gonna sit around forever on the ground like it would in the CG equals zero case. There's still gonna be a chance of delay propagation, but, <clears throat> But what it means is, what these conclusions mean is that flight two, in this, in this case here, these two cases, flight two's flight buffer is set at a value that it would be set at if flight two was operating all by itself. In other words, if flight two was just all by itself with no chance of delay propagation. So that's what it means um, when I say the ground buffer does all the work. Flight two's not. Flight 2's buffer is not being adjusted at all. Now, if this is if neither of these cases are true, um, flight two's buffer contributes to or partly offsets the ground buffer's delay propagation effect. So if, if flight two's buffer contributes to the delay propagation effect, the buffer is set at a bigger value than its single flight value. So it's helping out. It's trying to absorb the, the late arrival uh, possibility, helping the ground buffer. But if CF is um, bigger than CG, then, um, then, the ground, then the flight buffer doesn't do that. The ground buffer uh, takes over partly for, the, um, for flight two's buffer. Flight two does a little bit, um, little bit of delay propagation but not as much as, as the ground buffer, roughly speaking. Okay? At this point, let me ask if there, if there are questions. Uh, Hong Chan from the Beijing Jiao Tong University had a question. He said that uh, the ground buffer is uh, that there may be some restrictions with respect to choosing ground buffers in real world airport businesses, so to say. Absolutely, that's that's certainly true. And so, the, in the paper, we talk about what happens if you um, if the ground buffer is if it can't if it can't be set at a big enough value. If the ground buffer um, is constrained, then that has effects on the flight buffers, both flight buffers, actually. So you can read in the paper about that that question. It's quite right, though. But see, one of the ideas here, the ground buffer is supposed to capture these kinds of restrictions. In other words, if at a hub airport, say, which is very busy, where there's a lot of demand for gate space, the cost of ground time may be very high. So we sort of capture that, that sort of supply restriction on gate space in, in, the, in the CG value itself. Does that make sense? Okay, let me press on here. So one of the... Uh, we can do some comparative statics here. We don't get, get all that far with comparative statics in, in the general model. We only have a few, few results. But perhaps the most interesting comparative static is the one that involves the variance of the random terms. You know, remember epsilon one and epsilon two, those terms are drive this whole story. They're the, the idiosyncratic elements in the flight time for flight two. So, um, an interesting comparative static question is what happens if those variances get bigger? In other words, if there's more noise in the flight durations, 
and so what we to answer that question there's it's impossible to answer it analytically but to answer it we we did some simulations and so here's a here here are simulations the top one um shows the ground buffer which is the um which is the lower curve and the the two flight buffers which are the upper curve the flight buffers are almost exactly the same size or not quite but they're all they're almost indistinguishable so they're drawn as a single line here so what does this show on the model axis we have increasing variance by the way the variance for the two um the two epsilons is set to be equal we also look at the case where the variances are different across the two epsilons here they're set to be equal and so what do you see you see that <clears throat> that both the flight buffers both b1 and b2 and the ground buffer increase with the variance that's pretty pretty much natural right you would think that that both those that the buffer magnitude will get bigger as the um, as the variance goes up, but it's not totally intuitive because the bottom picture shows a different different parameter values where the ground buffer goes down as the um, as the variance goes up, with both flight buffers still rising. So it, it's a little uh, <clears throat> some things are as expected, other things are not when it comes to the variances. Okay, let's talk about the empirical work here. Um, we have some hypotheses that come out of the model. First one is that the variance of the flight error terms should affect all the buffers as seen in the simulation. Um, and we saw the directions of some of the effects. A higher ground cost is gonna affect the buffer sizes. The only comparative static result that we have is for B1, the, the, the flight buffer for the first flight. All the other effects are ambiguous, but we figure that that's okay. We're, we're gonna see empirically how a higher ground cost affects the buffer. And the higher ground cost is represented by hub airport dummy. Um, under some conditions, flight two has the larger flight buffer in our model. I didn't talk about the details, but that result suggests that the position in the flight sequence over the day for an airplane, whether you're flight one or flight two, should affect the magnitude of the buffer. So we don't have clear cut uh, conclusions for the model about that. But anyway, uh, we'll be exploring that too. The other thing is that the share of connecting passengers, which is in a model extension, should also matter. Um, we don't have analytical results on that because it's too complicated. But as you'll see, there's a very intuitive empirical expectation. Well, sorry, an empirical outcome, at least for one of the buffers. We, Particularly, we expect the ground buffer to be high for um, um, when there are a lot of connecting passengers. Okay, so those are the um, those are the empirical uh, predictions. So, what's the empirical setup? Well, as I said before, we have this this U.S. government data set has you know umpteen million observations that track individual aircraft over the operational day showing scheduled and actual departures and arrivals i'm not sure but i bet nobody else in the world has got these these data um, that further increases the u.s data advantage when it comes to airlines other countries should gather this stuff too so to get the flight buffers what we do is we compute the average flight time by non-stop route and aircraft type and subtract it from the individual scheduled flight times. So in other words, for, e for each type of plane, like 737 uh, aircraft <clears throat> and a particular route like Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, we, we take the average flight time for all 737 serving that route. And that's gonna be our M1, okay? And um, 
And the buffer is going to be the difference between the scheduled flight time and that average flight time. And we do that um, over and over again in computing these values. To get the ground buffer, we compute actual aircraft down to, uh, ground times. And we do this by aircraft type because the ground times may differ how, depending on how big the plane is. And then we take the minimum value, minimum of these, of these actual ground times to get the minimum feasible turnaround time, TG. And then we subtract TG, TG bar, sorry. We subtract TG bar from TG to get the ground buffer. Okay. All right, let's look at some tables. First table here. Um, this is pretty small on my screen. If it's <clears throat> on your screen, you should enlarge it so you can see it if, it if it's too small there. But regressions, we actually compute a flight time variability variable. And we, we do that. We, we compute the standard deviation of flight times that are root and aircraft specific using 2017 data, which is the year before our sample period. Okay. And so we're going to run a regression of all this stuff. So look at the variables. Here we've got the variability variables. Here we've got here we've got things like connecting passengers. We have a dummy for whether there's a hub origin or hub destination. We have a whole bunch of airline dummies. Then we have a dummy to indicate whether we're looking at a regional carrier, the number of competitors on the route, the managerial share of the origin city to capture business passengers, whether we're looking at a big plane. And the time of day, morning, afternoon, late afternoon, evening. Now, um, this sample that we use for these regressions consists of aircraft that only operate two flights a day, because that's what our model's about. It's about a two flight situation. And so these uh, aircraft are, are doing, what are they doing? Well, they're probably flying from New York to San Francisco, and then back from San Francisco uh, to New York. Basically, you need to have long, say, transcontinental flights if you're going to um, only have two flights a day. If you're southwest, flying short flights all day long, you're going to do way more than two. We'll come back to that in a minute, though. So this is just this just consists of uh, sample consists of only two flights. So what do we see when we look at the variability things? We, we measure them separately, so each flight's variability is in there separately. And what do we see? The flight buffers um, um, have positive coefficients, sorry, variability coefficients. So higher, higher variability uh, raises the flight buffer. I should point out that this, the first regression is just for flight one. The second regression is for flight two. These regressions pool the two flights okay so the higher very uh, higher variability leading to longer buffers well that's pretty much upheld in these empirical results what else do these things show well higher uh, more connecting passengers <clears throat> it's sort of weird the low shorter flight buffers that's kind of counterintuitive we'll see something better later on um Let's go down to the bottom here. Um, if we look at the um, most interesting things here are the, the morning, afternoon, late evening, evening. And what do we see? We see that the flight buffers for the late afternoon and evening flights are longer by about 0.6 of, and 0.4 minutes. So it's not, not a huge difference. This is all relative to early morning. So, the, the where you are in the um, in the day, in other words, is going to depend is going to uh, matter in determining the flight buffer. So if you're leaving from uh, San Francisco from New York to San Francisco in the morning, you're not going to have a long buffer. If you're going back in the late afternoon from San Francisco to New York, the flight buffer is going to be longer. Okay. We also um, have a variable for the second flight. We can have a dummy variable for the second flight. That variable doesn't is not significant here, for some reason. Um, 
So there's, those are the main findings here. Another interesting thing is that the regional carriers have um, shorter flight buffers by about two minutes. Okay. Now, in the re remaining regressions, we're going to drop these variability variables and use variables that basically function as proxies for flight variability. And one of the main proxy types of proxies we think about weather and weather is in turn proxied by the month in which the flight is operating. Okay. And there's other stuff too that we uh, we expect to um, to influence va variability. <coughs> Again, the idea on the weather thing, the idea is that weather can be good that, that one day, bad the next day, and so it, it imparts variability to the flight times observed over the year. Okay. Another uh, variable that we think affects variability is airport congestion. And the airport congestion is measured on the day, and I believe the hour, of the, of the flight's arrival. So that's another, another proxy for, um, for flight time variability. <clears throat> so here's the first part of the regression um, where we use these, um, these uh, variability proxies. And here now, since we're not looking at two flights anymore, we have both a two flight subsample, that's the one you saw on the last table, and an unrestricted sample where we, where we don't restrict the number of flights. We look at aircraft that have as many as eight flights a day. So first, what do we see? Well, it doesn't depend on whether we're looking at two flights or, uh, or more than two flights. If you look at the patterns on these month dummies, you find that, well, first of all, the, the default month is January. Okay, so January has a zero effect. And you see that once we get beyond March, all of the, um, the month dummies are negative. So what that says is that flight dummies are short outside of the winter months than they are during the, during the winter months. Uh, by on the order of five minutes, five, uh, four minutes down here, so on. Okay, so once again, <clears throat> the value for January is zero, that's the default month. February is insignificant, coefficients are insignificant. So both January and February are, are similar, but then the remaining months um, all have shorter uh, flight buffers. So that, tell, that seems to suggest that whether which is of course worse in the winter worse in the winter time is affecting flight variability and thus flight buffers. Okay. What else do we see? Um, now the connecting passengers is in, effect is insignificant. That's good because we didn't like that negative effect before. Makes more sense. There's no effect on on the flight buffers. <coughs> now here's inter <coughs> here are interesting coefficients. The hub origin and destination, all those coefficients are positive across all the regret, all the different regressions. Sorry. What I meant to say was that the congestion variables for the origin and destination, they are all positive across all the regressions. So we interpret the congestion as a variability question. Okay, that congestion is variable and it leads to variability in flight times. So high congestion leads to longer flight buffers, okay? A hub destination leads to longer flight buffers too, uniformly. A hub origin doesn't, if you look. A lot of those things are insignificant. So if we're flying into a hub, we wanna have a long flight buffer because we don't want the inbound aircraft to be late because it's connect, it is, its passengers are connecting to lots of other uh, Lots of other flights, so we're going to add some a buffer to a flight that has a hub hub destination. Okay, so that's the top of the table, and the difference between, across the regressions doesn't matter that much here. But for the second part of the table, the bottom part, we see some things here. First of all, we see that the regional carrier effect is negative all the way across, like it was before, and then distance. Flight distance is uh, contributes positively to, uh, to the flight buffers. In fact, distance is a major determinant of flight variability. 
uh, as we've seen from other, other regressions. Um, we still see the, um, for the two flight model, we still see the late afternoon, evening um, increase in the flight buffer. Um, here, it's a, little, it's a little bit less clear what's going on as we go from um, morning to uh, later in the day. But we can get a better picture of this by um, actually looking at the, at the order in the flight sequence of the particular flight. Remember, our aircraft are flying many flights a day, as many as eight, okay? And so, um, so what we see here, if you look at these coefficients, is that the flight buffers are kind of starting out low. They start at zero because the... Uh, because flight one is the default, and then they kind of go up, and then they go down again. So the flight buffer has a U-shaped uh, uh, pattern over the day, the operational day for an aircraft. And you can see this even better if we if we do um, if we just we count the position in the in the aircraft rotation and estimate a quadratic. So the quadratic has a positive um, a linear term and a negative squared coefficient. And so the, the quadratic is a nice upside down U-shaped uh, uh, sort of replicating this stuff here, okay? Um, once we, if we go back to the two flight sample, that's the first half of this picture, we see that now our flight two uh, dummy variable is significant uh, uh, and, and um, and positive as we would as we hoped. Okay, so it's sort of following the pattern over here with the multi-flight sample. All right, clear enough. Now, uh, so the last thing is um, is the ground buffer. We do the ground buffer regression for the um, with the variability uh, variables. But it's a little bit, the results are a bit mixed, and so I'm not showing them to you. I'm just showing you <clears throat> the ground buffer regressions with the variability proxies. So let's take a look. The months don't seem to, they don't have the same pattern. Up until the fall months, the ground buffers are kind of flat. The coefficients are basically zero, at least in the two flight model. In, the, in, the, in this flight model, the, the coefficients are lower than in January, February, but then the, the buffers start getting big again in the fall. It's not clear why that's true. So the, the month uh, effects on ground buffers are not crystal clear. It's not crystal clear quite what's going on there. But here's a welcome result. Look at the effect of connecting passengers. Connecting passengers lengthen the, the ground buffer. Um, this is the uh, percentage, the <clears throat> this is the effect of a, can't remember now the units. Anyway, the ground flights, when you have more passengers connecting between two flights, the ground buffer is longer. If you have a hub turnaround, in other words, the airplane is landing and taking off at a hub airport. You have longer ground buffer on the over 13 minutes. Now, if you have a congested turnaround airport, uh, there's a small negative effect. It's not quite clear what that's coming from. Uh, what else do we see here? Well, now we have all these different airline effects. Regional carriers have shorter ground buffers than um, than non-regional carriers. But here's a cool result. Low-cost carriers, we all know that they turn around their airplanes fast. They have short ground times by, by five minutes relative to non-low-cost carriers. That number seems actually small. You would think that it should be bigger than that, but that's what the numbers say. If we look at Southwest Airlines, Southwest Airlines up here, its, its coefficient is about minus five to minus seven. So Southwest has got even, is, is got a pretty short ground buffer too. Um, 
Okay. Um, what do we see when we look at the time of day? What we see is that the ground buffers get bigger and bigger during as the day progresses, as we go from morning to afternoon to late afternoon and so on. And this is true regardless of whether we're looking at the two flight sample or the um, multi flight sample. <clears throat> um, so we get we start out with 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 fairly small ground buffers, and then we go up to ground buffers that are uh, nine minutes longer in the evening than in the um, early afternoon or than in the early morning, and then it's even bigger when we look at two flights. Okay, that we have 20 minutes more ground buffer um, if the flight is leaving in the evening. Okay, and there's also a weekend effect too. It's not entirely clear where that comes from. Ground buffers are longer in the weekend. There was also a, a weekend effect on the uh, on the flight buffers. Okay, there are a few more things in the paper, but basically I've covered the waterfront here. Um, so this paper is the most detailed paper of airline buffer choices to date, partly because it has <clears throat> this theory and um, and also a whole bunch of empirics. Um, so what about further work? We could make the model richer by including um, more than two flights. Again, we'd need some numerical analysis there by fully analyzing flight connections. Now, what's interesting is that um, based on our experience so far with this paper, we we have realized that operations research people don't seem to like it. And in a way, it's not surprising because they come out of a, a different tradition. Um, and they wonder why we're writing down a, a stylized model like the one we do. It's kind of just a different uh, disciplinary approach to things. And there's no right and wrong way. But um, it was sort of amusing to see some of the reactions we got from the OR guys. And so if you if there are OR guys in the audience, you should be nicer to us next time. That's a joke. All right. So time for questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Ben. I think that was a, a, a great uh, uh, presentation. I think if, if you uh, uh, to the audience, so if you have questions, uh, so please unmute your mic and you can also unmute the video and please ask your questions. Okay. Anne? Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the great uh, presentation. I very much liked it. I do like the empirics with the OR site. Uh, I think it's a great match. Um, so where are, have, where are you? Where, oh, I'm, in, uh, I'm German. So I'm based, okay. uh, I'm Corona based in Germany at the moment. So um, I was late. just going <laughs> to... No, early. Okay, yeah. um, I have a question basically on your empirics, and that's uh, for your flight buffers, the way you calculate them, because we've been doing something related to this, um, and we had the impression that we get better empiric results when we don't go for the minimum flight time, basically the minimum feasible, as you were doing it there as a benchmark, um, but rather for like a 5%, 10% quantile of the fastest flight. Okay, so let me, let me respond to that. Um, <clears throat> our model, it turns out, our theoretical model can be recast to define the um, flight buffer as relative to the minimum flight time. Okay, so that, that's one point. The second point is, related to your question, is that our, our flight buffers are relative to the average flight time. So it's even di more different than what you were saying. The ground buffer is relative to the minimum. So, you know, it, it's possible that, that in the end we'll, we'll redo this empirical work using either the minimum flight time for the flight buffer or perhaps your idea of a five, fifth or, or tenth percentile. But so we, we take the point. Um, I understand uh, the, what you're saying. Other questions?
Uh, Han Chang, maybe yeah. you want to uh, ask a question about the because yeah. you had the issue with the ground buffer uh, restrictions. And uh, also Wayne had a question. Actually, he was Wayne was wondering, uh, asking a question uh, about um, doesn't other countries manage delays better than to use U.S. data? So the question is whether it would be useful to use some other data rather than U.S. data because perhaps other countries can manage delays better. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know whether the data exists elsewhere. Um, and Langa, what, what is uh, your hand is up again? Do you have any? Do you know? Do you have data in Europe for this? Uh, we do not. I mean, you can get away to get some of it, but not really good time. So we used some. We've used some uh, collected data before, but you wouldn't be able to download it not for free like you can in the on the US data set. No. Can you get US data in Europe? I mean, are you allowed to get it? We're using the BTS data constantly. Yeah, yeah it's free. All right. Okay. Yeah, because some of the data is restricted, but, but uh, good. Okay, so you, you're using that then. So do you have another question? If I may, yeah, I would, I'd be interested in finding, because we've been, uh, I know what you refer to when you talk about this OR empiric uh, moment. Um, so I was just interested because one, one comment we got before for doing something not topic-wise related, but kind of approach-wise related was that related was that we were getting why don't you just go and ask the, the managers, right? They know you're basically tracing from data managerial decisions in a way. Um, and we had a hard time fighting with the reviewer on kind of getting rid of this argument. So what is your approach on this? Well, I mean, I, I, agree. I, I can understand that point, but um, I guess the question is, you talk to one manager and they tell you one thing and another manager tells you a different thing. So what's the conclusion? I mean, it would be nice to, to supplement uh, empirical evidence like this with some comments from managerial uh, types, but it's not a substitute by any means. Um, okay. Kun, Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I Kun, Kun had a question. Uh, so maybe Kun, maybe you just unmute your mic and ask the question. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you for this very great presentation and great paper. Actually, I'm doing some uh, this kind of uh, buffer analysis for the Chinese market, but the problem is that uh, we cannot get the ground buffer time because uh, we don't have the tail, num uh, tail number of the aircraft. So I think uh, this paper is great. So you can uh, disentangle the buffer of the ground and uh, the flight. So this is yeah. really uh, very useful. And I already cited this paper in my working paper. So thank you very much. I might have two I, I actually may, I may have seen your paper. I won't tell you where, but. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I have two questions the, uh, about the empirical part. The first question is the, uh, um, uh, the distance. So uh, uh, in the empirical part, uh, uh, it seems the distance increases the variability of the flight. Uh, yes. The flight time. And uh, uh, my uh, question is that sometimes the, the flight can accelerate. I mean, they can raise the speed if uh, they depart delay from origin airport. So the longer distance, uh, is it possible to provide the pilot some flexibility to accelerate thus, uh, such that they can, I mean, to compensate? No, that makes, that, that makes sense. But that makes sense, but it could be that you know the more distance you have, the more chance, the more opportunities there are for things to uh, to lengthen exactly. the flight. The more chances that you run into bad weather, you have to go around it. But I agree with, with your point, though, that distance you would think also gives more of a chance to to make up. Uh, we should actually put that in the paper. I can remember that point. <laughs> uh, yeah. I did look at this, uh, and uh, one of the issues is that ke to keep in mind that fuel cost is one of the major the major part of the operating cost of an airline. So the main objective of the airline is really to you know optimize the speed in order to uh, minimize fuel consumption. Uh, and then if you deviate 
from this, maybe you don't want to deviate too much from this. So uh, I, right. you know, our data sort of uh, indicates is that the the chance of having interruption or noise is higher if the flight distances are longer, has a stronger effect on the noise rather than perhaps counter uh, the flexibility effect. Uh, so, uh, that but anyway, I think I think in our in the paper we should put a footnote we'll recognizing this um, uh, other idea. Uh, and uh, so, the, you know, and, you know, theoretically, I, I, you know, sort of there is the point there that you can uh, uh, manipulate the speed and compensate, but empirically, it doesn't seem to be a major factor. So, mm, yeah. Okay. Other question that makes sense. Yeah, the other question is that uh, now the regressions are in the reduced form, so we are looking at the exogenous variables impacting on different buffer times. So, is it possible to estimate the three equations together, like B1, B2, and uh, the uh, and the BF? Uh, uh, sorry, BG, the ground buffer in the system uh, equation. I mean, then, I suppose uh, you could argue. Yeah, you could uh, do that. The only reason to do that would be if you thought that the errors were correlated across observations. Exactly. There's no um, gain from doing that. Yeah, but uh, you can see the how the B, for example, B2 affects B1, and uh, B, like BG affects B1, B2. Uh, I mean, in a causal oh, yeah, um, but, inferences. Yeah, but we don't. But but see, uh, we've um, we talked about things like that, and 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 the problem is that you don't want to. My view is you don't want to be regressing one buffer on another. And it's because they're mm -hmm. all endogenous. They're, endogenous all, endogenous. they're all choice right. variables. Like I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to regress my consumption of um, breakfast cereal on my consumption of chicken, right? Because I'm they're both mm -hmm. they're both decision variables for me. And you want to have stuff on that's exogenous on the right hand side i mean otherwise you'd need to find instrumental variables uh, instrumental for, variables for the one that's on the on the right hand side so i don't think that it's a good thing to do okay understand yeah that makes sense okay thanks sure thank you very much uh, there is another uh, when maybe when maybe you can just unmute your mic and ask a question So, or I will just read it. Um, uh, Wayne, can you uh, un uh, unmute your mic? Or maybe we have a. So, so first, Wayne mentioned that you can. Uh, I think this is a question or a comment about uh, the Chinese data set and the issue about um, being able to identify ground time. You can write algorithms to write actual uh, write time for report uh, on open source to create the data yourself. Then uh, I, I let's only get author, uh, or authorization from flight operations in time. So pilots have no discretion for saying that you know it's for the pilot they cannot just decide on their own to up you know to speed up or not because this is this requires some authorization. Well, that's a very right. good point. They, they, they would contact their dispatch op officer. The dispatcher is the guy who decides that. I see. Who's yeah. running, who's in charge of the flight. Yeah. And he also highlights that the, the flight operations will calculate delay cost and fuel cost. Yeah. No, absolutely. He just that his connection is not very good, which is why I guess he's unmuting the right. mic. Right. There's another question or a comment by Kelvin. Kelvin, uh, Poon, maybe you can just uh, unmute your mic and then ask a question or make a comment. Or I, I can just read it. Uh, so uh, what he writes, Kelvin writes, Kelvin Poon, is uh, we use cost index to control between cost and flight time. We can speed up, but we need to pay more 
on the fuel cost. If only delay, we normally need to speed up. We normally speed up a uh, higher cost index and the flight in case we need to avoid curfew or critical Q hours issue. Yeah, that's another issue, right? I mean, of course, the incentive, I think what, what this highlights is that the incentives um, to, you know, manipulate speed are higher uh, if there is some curfews involved or critical crew hours. Uh, so uh, that right. yeah, that's true. Sort of that's true. That may be more relevant than perhaps what we found in our data. That's true. Yeah. So these are very valuable comments. Actually, I also think uh, maybe this issue about collecting data from uh, to collect data yourself from open source, like I don't know, flight radar or something, and then you can uh, write an algorithm to get the ground time. So the, I, I think uh, that's a, a, a very nice comment uh, because uh, I would like to ask I would like to ask Ann Longa a question. Sure. Are you still? Sure, sorry, it just takes a second to turn on the mic. So what do you think about the, our use of the average flight time to compute the flight buffer? I'm not sure I would like to see the empirics and what what it does, but it seem I would suggest it makes like what you were presenting there was basically on minimum flight times, right? Or was it on average no, flight times? It was average. But but like average? I said, the theory the theory translates directly to the minimum case. But to use the minimum, we'd have to redo our data. It not, it's not that big a deal, but we'd have to redo it. Oh, it, it took us forever to do. Um, May I have one comment to this? Actually, for the flight time, we use the flight time. For hey, Akam, you know, Akam, you're breaking up really badly. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know why, but. Yeah, I, I okay. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, Jan, maybe you can just. Uh, that the, for the flight time we use the expected flight time, for the ground time we use the minimum ground time because for the ground time it's more difficult to calculate the expected ground time because yeah because there is a buffer involved. But for the flight time you can definitely calculate the expected flight time. Right. But the, the argument might be that it makes more sense to use the minimum flight time. Again, some referee might tell us to use the minimum. Yeah. All right. Uh, are there other questions? Let me just tell uh, the people the people who were uh, ask, who were doing similar work. I'd be happy to get an email from you if you want to talk about this for uh, some more. Okay. I'd be happy to communicate further on it. And Akim would as well. He's a he's a co-author. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So. Uh, I want to uh, thank you very much, uh, Jan. I think it was an excellent presentation, and uh, you know we had a great audience from all over the world. Anne, for Anne, it was like four in the morning when we started the session. So thank you very much for for joining. Uh, we had our participants from Brazil, from Japan, from everywhere. So uh, thank you very much, also for uh, you know. Uh, contributing to the discussion was great. I want to thank Anne for, for the organization, and uh, but especially uh, Jan for this great presentation and for taking the time to join this uh, research uh, seminar. So uh, I think now we're going to uh, stop the recording and finish the session and, uh, uh, you know, uh, hope to see you uh, soon, uh, not just online, but also face to face. Uh, once we have, uh, you know, uh, passed this, hopefully soon, the, this pandemic. So thank you very much again, and uh, bye bye. Akim, why don't you stick around for a minute? Yeah, I will. Okay, I will. I will stop the recording right now.